So, in this session, we will start with our discussion regarding inverse response. Directly, we will start with an example. Let us think of an electrically heated boiler. <coughs> we have the electrical coils and here is the power supply. So, we have the water flow rate, say Fi, and we have the vapor. So, these bubbles are being generated and let us say we calculate or we actually measure the level as the depth above and over this electrical coil and this is the feed water. Now, in the steady state uh, F i and V they are same right the inflow and outflow mass flow rates they are same. So, there is no accumulation and the level remains same. Now, think that we have increased the F i by a step input say this is t equal to 0, this is f i and this is f i s yes. and we have given certain step height. So, our objective is to answer the question that what will happen to h. Generally, we will think that okay, h will definitely start increasing from its steady state, but to a surprise the profile of H prime, let us say this is the steady state, profile of H prime will be something like this. Initially, there will be a decrease in level, right. And though the phenomena seems to be absurd, but actually we have all witnessed it in our kitchen, right. When we put a mug of cold water in a boiling pool of water suddenly the level decreases. Why? Because this vapor bubble they shrinks abruptly shrinks in volume causing a sudden reduction or progressive reduction in the level and after that the level again will start increasing because we have increased this FI. So, initial trend and the final trend they are different and that is why this is typically referred as inverse response. This is typically referred as inverse response. So, what are the processes actually? If I think with an introspection we can understand that a normal expected process is a capacitative growth, right. Because this electrical coil the current and everything is constant. So, it will generate a constant V. Now, if I increase the mass flow rate in this inlet water obviously, there will be a capacitive response of the system and the height will grow indefinitely before overflowing. But additionally, we have another process which acts in opposite direction that means it has got a negative gain right and that process is something like this a first order response and superimposing these two dotted curve we can get this intermediate curve that is pretty obvious. So, the tentative block diagram we may think that this is the process. producing the output and that is the block diagram, right. 
So basically, it is something like this. Now, if I've given a step input, so this is a by s. So overall, it will be k1 a by s square minus k2 a tau 2 s plus 1 into 1 by s. So here, I will have k1 a into t minus k2 a 1 minus a to the power minus t by tau. Now, y infinity is k1 a or basically uh, here it is infinite, so it is positive, right, because this will saturate to this minus of k2 a, but this part will grow indefinitely, so it will reach infinity, theoretically. However, Initially, it must go to the opposite direction, which means that if I take the derivative, it must be negative, right. So, derivative is k1a minus k2a plus e to the power minus t by tau 2 into minus of 1 by tau 2. Now, this derivative at time t equal to 0 is k1a minus k2a by tau 2, k1a minus k2a by tau 2. Now, what does it mean? And this derivative is negative. That means k1 minus k2 by tau 2 is negative, k1 is less than k2 by tau 2 or k1 tau 2 is less than k2. This must happen, otherwise the system, if this derivative is positive, then we will not go at any kind of inverse response like, if the process is the two component processes, one is this of high slope and another is this, then I will have something like this, okay. The overall process will be something like this. So, this is not an inverse response, not uh, an inverse response. However, this one is. So, the condition is definitely for this specific case, this uh, y prime infinity is infinity, right. So, it is on the positive side. However, the derivative at time t equal to 0 that is the initial derivative must be negative, right. So, that is why the trends are opposite and it is going to give you inverse response. Now, this condition has got a specific implication in the transfer function. Let us again discuss what is the respective implica implication of final time domain analysis in the transfer function. See y prime s divided by f prime s that is g s is k 1 by s minus k 2 by tau 2 s plus 1. So, s into tau 2 s plus 1 k 1 tau 2 k 1 tau 2 s plus k 1 minus k 2. Right. Yeah, k1 tau 2 s uh, minus k2 s, sorry, k2 s. So, you see that numerator of this transfer function, the respective roots are called 0. Roots of the numerator of a transfer function is called are called 
zeros, zeros, basically zeros of the transfer function. So what is the zero here? Z one. It is k one divided by k two minus k one tau two. Now you see k one. the first process that is positive and for that specific condition k1 tau2 is less than k2 this is also positive as a result zero is positive right so that's a general observation that whenever the system at for that specific system uh, if the zero is positive right the system is bound to give an inverse response so the fact is that this is actually a universal condition that means if a system has got at least one zero in its transfer function then it is bound to give or bound to produce inverse response now we have to justify this statement i'm not going to prove it but we have to justify this statement from other uh, similar systems which are prone to give inverse response see for example we consider uh, two fast order processes right so overall is k1 divided by tau1 plus s minus k2 by tau2 s plus 1 so for a step input f prime bar s is equal to a by s where a is positive then <coughs> what will be the output so y prime bar s or directly y prime t we can write k1 into a 1 minus e to the power minus t by tau 1 minus k2 into a 1 minus e to the power minus t by tau 2 right so y prime infinity is k1 a minus k2 a now what is the slope d1 dy prime dt at t equal to 0 so it is uh, k1 a by tau 1 minus k2 a by tau 2 right now if k1 is greater than k2 y prime infinity is positive now if i have to make the slope negative then for inverse response this must be negative that is k1 by tau1 minus k2 by tau2 must be negative that is k1 tau 2 must be less than k2 tau 1 okay so if it is less then it must be greater right because there if k1 is less than k2 then the final output will be negative and under this situation k1 tau 2 must be greater than k2 tau 1 so let's uh, have an implication in respect to the or with respect to zero so gs is k1 tau 2 s plus k k1 minus k2 tau 1 s minus k2 
divided by tau 1 s plus 1 tau 2 s plus 1. So, what is the 0? The 0 is k 2 minus k 1 this minus k 1 k 1 tau 2 minus k 2 tau 1. Now, you see I have mentioned that 0 must be positive. So, k 2 greater than k 1 or let us say k 1 is greater than k 2 right. So, numerator is negative. So, denominator must also be negative. So, k 1 tau 2 must be less than k 2 tau 1. So, it is uh, k 1 tau 2 must be less than if k 1 is greater than k 2 k 1 tau 2 must be less than k 2 tau 1 to have inverse response this we have justified from the positive 0 condition or else if k 1 is less than k 2 k 1 tau 2 must be greater than k 2 tau 1. So, the condition to have inverse response for two first order processes is k 1 greater than or less than k 2 for that k 1 tau 2 k 1 tau 2 must be less than or greater than k 2 tau 1. So, that is the general condition. Okay. So, similarly, if I have a first order system plus a dead dime, two first order systems plus dead dime. So, just like uh, G s is k 1 into e to the power minus uh, tau d 1 s by tau 1 s plus 1 minus k 2 into e to the power minus tau d 2 s by tau 2 s plus 1. Right. So, just try to understand that uh, if I have this and I have this where this k 1 is greater than k 2. However, this is tau d 2 and this much is tau d 1. So, tau d 1 is also greater than tau d 2. So, then and then only we will have inverse response in our system and the overall response will be something like this. Right, the initial trend and the final trend are just opposite to each other. So, here also we can uh, this get the condition that k 1 greater than k 2 and tau d 1 greater than tau d 2 right as a condition of inverse response if we set this positive 0 condition and we use this pads approximation first order approximation maybe ok. So, that is basically the inverse response and remember the condition that the system must have at least one positive 0 in its transfer function. So, that I have not proved in a general way, but if the system has got or we have we have shown it through examples, if the system has got at least one positive 0 right in its transfer function, then it is bound to give you inverse response. So, that is all about the inverse response and we have also covered the dead time in the previous session. So, now we switch to understanding the dynamics and the components first, first the components and next the dynamics of feedback control system. So, it is the understanding of feedback control system. You see that again let us go back to the schematic of feedback control system. What is there? See, uh, I have a process which must have at least one disturbance 
and at least one manipulated variable producing the output. Right. So this is referred as open loop system. Then closed loop means the loop here signifies the feedback loop. So what is the closed loop system? I have the system, disturbance, output, manipulated variable. Now the output first is to be measured. So here we will have the measuring device. So it goes to the comparator where we must be giving the set point. Set point with plus, measured variable minus, so it produces the error. So that error goes to controller. And finally, the controller's decision, CT, is implemented via final control element on manipulated variable. Let's call it MT and disturbance. DT producing the output YT and measuring device output is YMT. Right. So this is the closed loop system. Right? So that's the basic idea of feedback loop. So you see that in majority of the cases what happens? We have a measuring device and there are basically what we want to control. We want to control either level or pressure or flow or temperature or composition. These five major variables. So accordingly we must have level sensor or level indicator, pressure indicator, flow indicator, temperature indicator and composition indicator. <coughs> so you see this measuring device we must discuss in this other part of this process control that is the instrumentation there we will discuss it. So from the measuring device it generates the output and commonly the output is in terms of electronic signal which varies in the range of 4 to 20 milliampere. So that goes to comparator and comparator generates the error. The comparator simply generates the error. So error by definition is y set minus y m right set point is y set. So comparator from the comparator and actually the comparator is integral part of the controller. So from the comparator the signal goes to controller, controller generates another electronic signal CT which is the controller's output right and that goes to FC. Now you see that FC in majority of the cases, FC in majority of cases in relation to a process plant is a pneumatic control valve. Right. This input is pressure signal. So that electronic signal of the controller is to be converted to pressure signal. So we have 4 to 20 milliampere signal. It goes, it must go to a device which will convert it to 3 to 15 psig equivalent scale and that goes to final control element. 
and that device which equivalently convert an electronic signal into pressure signal is called transducer or in industrial jargon it is IP converter current to pressure converter. So, let us have a very basic understanding of an IP converter right an example of a transducer how it functions see it may be a lever a first order lever which has got a fulcrum here right uh, and we have this current signal coming here and uh, it is a form of coil right. So, in section it looks like this right and here this coil pass through the annular section of this sort of a permanent magnet so in 3d it looks like the magnet is like this right and the coil is inserted here Right. So, what will happen you see if I increase this 4 to 20 milli ampere signal and if in this coil if I look the coil from this uh, opposite end if I create the north polarity by going for a counterclockwise rotation of current definitely in this coil let us say this is the coil. Right, and in, if in this coil we have the current being rotated anti clockwise from this phase, if we see it from this phase, right. So, the current if it is rotating anti clockwise, it will generate north polarity. Now, if on the other hand the magnet on this surface is of the north polarity, with the increase of current, the electromagnetic the, the electric the magnetic intensity of this field produced by the coil will increase and the repulsive force will also increase. So, once the repulsion increases the gap here the lever will try to move down right. So, now what we will have on this side? We will have a nozzle. Right, a nozzle where we deliver say 20 psi g here right and here we have a spring and this side of the lever from the top it looks like a flapper right. So, what will happen? and here we have no deface and all. What will happen? I am supplying here 20 psi g. Now, as the current increases this moves downward. So, the leakage flow decreases and here the pressure signal will increase correct and this we will pick up as pneumatic signal after proper calibration. And if I arrange or design this system in such a way, so that for 4 we will get 3 and for 20 you will get 15 psi g, right. And the scale will change equivalently, okay. So, that is a typical example of a transducer that when once the current goes to 4, it moves back and remain horizontal, right. 
So here there will be huge air leakage and the pressure from 20 psig will be picked up as 3 psig here okay because we have a huge leakage at this nozzle but on the other hand if it is 20 then the repulsion will be high the deflection will be like this this leakage will be minimized and accordingly we will have a very high pressure which is 15 psig right so that is the functioning of a transducer so this is a random, there are different other mechanism by which a transducer can work. So this is typically a simple example what we have discussed and in this way a transducer can work and it will convert the electronic signal of a controller to the pneumatic signal because most of the final control elements in a process uh, industry is pneumatic control valve which is activated by means of pneumatic signal. Okay. So that is the discussion regarding the transducer. So we have discussed about the, the measuring device is a part of instrumentation, controller we have not discussed right now, we will discuss it and final control element a part of it I have discussed but the relation between the stem position and the volume flow rate have not been discussed. So before going into that, uh, let us have a discussion regarding the controllers. Now you see that all these devices are also connected by transmission lines. Nowadays once we have an electronic signal there is no decay in this signal and the signal ke is kept intact throughout the long distance transportation line maybe in the order of kilometer. The device is 1 kilometer away from the control room it may happen right. So still the signal is nearly instantaneous but in older fashion uh, still now there are some pneumatic lines as well. So if I think of pneumatic lines, so the outlet pressure and the inlet pressure, the respective transfer function, it follows a dead time element plus a first order system with gain 1, right. And generally this tau d by tau t is in the order of 1 by 4. But nowadays these uh, equations and all they are meaningless because we, we never use this pneumatic transmission lines, we always use electronic transmission lines or electronic signals, right. So with that understanding, let us go for, uh, okay, but a bit before that. Let us have some examples of level control, right, so feedback level control. Let us say which is very important at the bottom of a distillation column, right. So here we have this uh, <coughs> down cover from the tray above. So here it accumulates, and it goes to this reboiler unit, right, and from here. It overflows and accumulates on the other side and from here we withdraw it. Now here we need a level control, okay. So we will have a level sensor that is LT, then it goes to level controller and here we have the control valve and this must be sub. Uh, provided with the input, right. So this is the typical level control. So pressure control we can have at the top of a distillation column, right. So here we have this down comer here the reflux lines. So pressure control 
here we must have uh, pressure sensor PT it goes to pressure controller supplied with pressure set point and it activates these valves okay flow control here we have a pump control valve and here it's a measuring device which is basically an orifice meter so ft flow controller set point and this so that's the typical feedback flow control then we have temperature control right so examples of a temperature control may be uh, a reactor or rather let's say heat exchanger right a shell and tube heat exchanger we have the hot fluid flowing through the tube side let's say it's one one pass and here we have the cold fluid flowing in and here it's flowing out right the hot fluid outlet temperature is my control objective so i'll measure the temperature temperature transmitter then temperature controller and here we must deliver the set point the composition we can have just like see here is a condenser then we have the accumulated drum right then a part we are withdrawing and a part we pump and here we have this reflux valve right so here we have the ct cc composition set point and it operates this valve so in the same distillation column we have level control we have pressure control we have composition control flow control is a different tissue altogether and finally here it's a temperature control so we can these are the five different or five major process variables what we need to control in a process industry now regarding control now controller you see that uh, nowadays we all have this programmable controller programmable logic controller there is some uh, this input output relation what we know for the device that is simply being utilized to design what should be the corrective measure if any deviation actually happens because of certain disturbances so these are precisely the programmable logic controller now what is actually the logic the actually you see that what controller what we are going to discuss that's the typical originally developed in analog mode right now definitely you can program it in digital platform but in this analog mode they operate based on numerical uh, this uh, this sorry the pneumatic uh, manipulation with with using flapper nozzle bellow spring etc okay and the logic there relied on three principal mathematical operation one is proportionality another is integral another is derivative okay so what i am trying to discuss here and what is given in standard textbook of process control are basically those analog controllers logic right 
definitely you can implement and nowadays these are also being implemented because they are simple to construct and uh, program and simple to operate and tune as well ok. So, we are going to discuss this uh, proportional, proportional integral and proportional integral derivative controllers. So, this proportional controller. Why there is so this, this such proportionality why it is so important. Here the logic is corrective action is proportional to the present error. This is pretty simple but uh, it is highly logical. Right. So, you see that controller's output C t will be equal to K c the proportionality constant into epsilon t. Right. However, we have to understand that if epsilon is 0 whether C t will be 0 definitely not. So, we have to put a bias signal. Right. Bias signal. This bias signal is important that controller must retain its previous corrective action when this error is 0. That means, we have reached steady state. So, it must be kept at its bias. Okay. So, that is the input output time domain relation for proportional controller and the Kc is a proportionality constant. Right. So, its range is uh, how much what is the range? Uh, 0.5 uh, sorry 1 by 5 to 100. So, K c generally range is between 100 to 1 by 5. Actually, K c is alternatively represented in terms of proportional band which is 100 by K c. This is called proportional band. What is the physical interpretation of proportional band? See, 100 means it is in terms of percentage. Okay. So, C t or rather C prime t is equal to K c into epsilon because the steady state controller's output is C s. So, C prime is basically C t minus C s. So, C prime is equal to K c into epsilon t or epsilon prime t as steady state error is 0. Right. So, you see that uh, controller's output if it changes from 0 to 100 percent, 100 percent means corresponding to 20 milliampere, 0 means 4 milliampere or in pneumatic scale it is 3 to 15 psig right so over the full swing change of this controller's output from 0 to 100 right what should be the respective change of error so if this is 100 kc into epsilon and epsilon we call this is pb right so pb becomes 100 by kc so what is the physical interpretation of pb pb must be the percentage change of error in order to have 0 to 100 percent change of controller's output. Right. So, that is the physical significance of proportional band. And obviously, it is very important to note that once the error changes by that much percentage, what will happen? The controller output gets saturated. Okay. Just like the saturation phenomena, 
of controller's output, we can see that say this is 20 milliampere and this is 0 milliampere, right. So it may change like this. Oh, sorry. For a certain kind of error. So this is called the output is being saturated. So where, where the error basically uh, jumps from low to very high. So definitely the controller's output gets saturated and it jumps from 4 to 20 milliampere, right. So this is called the saturation of the cut controller. So what is in language as written as in controller operation always there is a maximum and minimum value of CT. And that CT cannot cross in either way. This is called the output range. So this is the output range shown by the dotted line of the controller. In pneumatic controller, this is 3 to 15, whereas in electronic controller is 4 to 20 milliampere DC. So here, uh, in general, for any controller, it's not only true for proportional controller. If the error at some point of operation becomes too high or low, so mathematically CT becomes more or less than the higher or lower bound of its output, but physically it will be at, 40, at 20 and at 4. So that is called the saturation of the controller, okay. Now you see that uh, in relation to the proportional controller, we have another simplified version of the proportional controller, but that gives rise to or that actually it is a limiting form of a proportional controller, right. A uh, limiting form of P controller is the well known or is the so called on off controller, right. Now theoretically we can say that when Kc tends to infinity, what will happen? C prime t is infinity for epsilon not equal to 0 and 0 for epsilon equal to 0. Now physically it cannot never be infinity, physically it is 20 milliampere and this is physically 4 milliampere. So there will be no intermediate value possible for this sort of controller. So we will say that 20 milliampere means it is on and 4 milliampere means it is off. So that is why it is called this on off controller as a limiting form of this proportional controller, okay. So what will happen in an on off controller, see the controller output will be just like this for a certain change of error. C prime t. So this is on, this is off and it may give rise an oscillation to this output. Right, the output will accordingly oscillate, right, with a de definitely delayed period. Uh, just like you have seen that in any water bath, right. So there we use this on off controller and say we have connected the heater to 15 ampere plug. So if the and we have set a or we have given a set point of say 70 degree Celsius. So if the temperature is below 70 degree, through this heater coil, there will be always a current of 15 ampere, right. So even if it is 69.9 degree, the current will still be 15 ampere. And once it goes to 70, right, when the error is 0, it will switch off. So when it increases because of inertia, it will again still remain switch off. But now the water bath will dissipate heat and after that it will again come back to this 70 and goes down again from 0 the current coil 
the current in the coil of the heater jumps to 15 ampere. So, just like here it is some 69 degree, here it is some 71 degree, so it is oscillating. Definitely the, the graph is not in the scale, proper scale as that of this, the scale, two scales are not same. Maybe here it is like this, then like this, much, much delayed, okay. So, it is uh, stretched response what we will have in typically in case of on off controller. Now you see uh, what is the integral mode then? Actually we will see later when we go for understanding the dynamics of the feedback control loop that uh, unless the system is pure capacitive, P controller will leave the system with some steady state error. Right. So, there will be always some steady state error in case of a P controller unless the system is purely capacitive. So, we need to chase that error even if it is very small we should go on increasing the corrective action. That means, the local uh, value of the error may not be important, its nature of persistence is important and the persistence can be given weightage if we integrate the error from time t equal to 0 to present. Right. So, we have the logic of proportional PI or proportional integral controller. What is that? Here the proportional uh, part will remain same, but additionally we have, we are given a corrective action which is proportional to the integrated error and the constant definitely is different, it is Kc by tau y. Right. So, this tau i has got a physical significance, we will discuss about it. This is called the reset time or repeat time. So, this is basically, uh, this is the time interval, this is the time interval over which the initial control action is being repeated, right. So, what does it mean? Let us say this C prime is obviously here, it is K C into epsilon prime T plus K C by tau i. 0 to t epsilon prime dt. Hmm. So, um, let us say the error this changes by a step input or epsilon prime t uh, epsilon prime versus t changes by a step in this is t equal to 0 and this is a. We have intentionally given that step. What will be the response of a pi controller? So, it is C prime and it is T. So, initially the error it is 0, right. Initially it is 0 up to T equal to 0. Now, T equal to 0 as it encounters this rise in the local error, the proportional mode will be activated and it will increase the controller's output by an amount Kc into A, right. Now, after that at time t equal to tau i, what is the local error? A. So, the proportional controller let us say C prime 0 a 0 minus equal to 0, C prime 0 plus equal to Kc into A. Now, C prime at tau i 
proportional control of the action will remain same plus integral this is a so a into tau y right at t equal to tau y so a into tau y kc by tau y so another kc into a so this is 2 kc a so it will be some 2 kc a at t equal to tau y similarly at t equal to this 2 tau y it is 3 kc a so it will increase indefinitely under unless the error is zero right it will increase but definitely in physical sense mathematically it will progressively increase but if physically it will saturate so physically what will happen it will be like this and it saturates to maximum range of this output and that is 20 milliampere but theoretically the controller's output will go on increasing indefinitely hmm. and that is the implication of reset time because you see the in initial control action is kc into a and that is being repeated over an interval of tau y again being repeated over an interval of tau y. So that is why it is called reset time or repeat time or integral time constant. So in generally in industrial controller this is less than 50 minute and uh, I think it is uh, 0.1 minute. So, um, now the next is that, uh, so with proportional integral logic, we can actually reduce the error to 0, okay. Like uh, if I see this for a real life process, um, this is the initial steady state. Right, say this is the steady state, yeah, this is the steady state, and let us say there is an error, okay, and we have a feedback control system. So, for a pro uncontrolled system or open loop system, it may be like this uncontrolled right for a p controller it will be like this it will reduce the error but it cannot reduce the error to zero unless it is a pure capacitive process now for a pd controller sorry pi controller it will reduce the error but as this uh, chasing the error and the respective controller saturation etc etc it is a time taking process and that is why the integral mode is a sluggish control mode which will uh, st stretch the duration before the or before the final steady state is being reached which is again a zero order state. So this much time is required we want to reduce the time and how we can do that if we anticipate the trend of error and that is the derivative mode mathematically a derivative can anticipate the trend of a function that if we go on calculating the derivative we can see that whether the function is increasing or decreasing and similar is the error right so we go for pid control proportional integral derivative logic so here ct first the proportional control action next the integral control action and we will go for another action which is proportional to the local derivative and the constant is kc into tau d right where tau d is the derivative time constant right so as we are uh, thinking of the local or the present end of error the derivative mode of control action is also referred as anticipatory mode 
right. Now, lastly, we will discuss about the transfer function of these three different types of controller. You see, for proportional controller, C prime t is equal to Kc into epsilon prime t, right. So, Gc, the controller's transfer function is simply equal to Kc, which is C prime bar by epsilon prime bar. Now, C prime t is equal to Kc into epsilon prime t, epsilon prime t plus Kc by tau i 0 to t epsilon prime t dt. So, if we take the Laplace, it is C prime s is equal to Kc into epsilon prime bar s plus Kc by tau i. Now, integrals Laplace is epsilon prime bar by and divided by s. So, C prime by epsilon prime which is Gc for pi controller is Kc within bracket 1 plus 1 by tau i s. Right? So, that is for pi controller. Now, for PD controller, there will be an additional term. Let me write that C prime t is equal to Cs, sorry, uh, Kc into epsilon prime plus Kc by tau i 0 to t into epsilon prime dt plus Kc tau d d epsilon dt. So, if we take the derivative, C prime bar is equal to Kc into epsilon prime bar plus Kc by tau i s into epsilon prime bar plus Kc into tau d into s into epsilon prime bar. So, from there we can get that C prime bar by epsilon prime bar Kc 1 plus 1 by tau i s plus tau d s. So, these are the three transfer functions of three different types of controller. So, in the next session we will be discussing about the final control element which is the pneumatic control valve and also the dynamic response of this feedback control loop.